This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Suffering is something all of us are too familiar with. Today we'll look at it in two ways. Rebecca McLaughlin joins me today. She's author of Confronting Christianity. She's going to discuss, does God really allow suffering or does he permit suffering? But first, I'm joined by a dear friend, former colleague at TV44, Ginger Stocky, who along with Joyce Meyer Ministries is making an impact on young women all over the world who are being abused, neglected, or just being denied basic human rights. If you never knew it, Joyce Meyer Ministries is around the world. They're meeting needs all over the world. And with me today is Ginger Stocky. She's back today. Glad to have you with us, Ginger. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not Joyce, but you know, take what yep. you can get. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, but the, our, 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 our audience knows you, you know, and they know Joyce too, but they see Joyce on television. They see Joyce teaching, but a lot of times they don't see all the things that you, 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 your ministry is doing all around the world. Yeah, we are so honored to be able to share Christ through the teaching that Joyce does and through sharing the Word of God and also physically loving people, another way of sharing Christ through our Hand of Hope route reaches all over the world. Yep. And Hand of Hope has one area that I want to talk to you about today and that's called Project Girl. How long has that been up and running? You know, I want to say it's been about four years now, but the interesting thing is we've been reaching out to women and girls um, in big ways as long as we've been doing any outreach at all. And we really began to realize that God was opening more and more doors to be able to help. And a long time ago, several mm -hmm. years ago, when human trafficking really came to light mm -hmm. and everybody began to see what a big problem this was, was when we jumped into that as soon as we could and really started doing as much as possible. So the main initiatives through Project Girl, and, and Project Girl stands for um, GRL, Guide, Restore, and Love. Mm -hmm. So we're guiding them into what God wants them to do and restoring them from horrible things like human trafficking and loving them with the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we, we found that some of the basic things really impact women and girls um, more than it does men, even though we're always helping everybody all the time. And of course, we, we care greatly about all people. But when you talk about things like not enough clean water, it's usually the women and the young girls who have to walk sometimes an entire day for that water. Therefore, they can't go to school. They don't get an education. They get water when they do finally get to some hole in the ground to get it. They bring back disease to their family. So freshwater initiatives are a huge part of, of what we're able to do. And then education, making sure in some parts of the world and, and villages and things that we've been in in different countries where it's just not even considered to educate a girl, it's just not important, that we're able to come in, provide schools, provide schooling and help change that. Human trafficking. Uh, rescuing women out of that and then also helping them to start their life over and to get the healing that God wants to give them from that horrible situation. And even feeding because sadly enough, there are families that cannot feed all their children and they have to choose. And many of them will choose to feed a boy over a girl because that boy can support the family. So being able to help in those areas is what Project Girl is all about. And the biggest thing, the number one thing, is just for all women and girls to know how loved and valued they are and what a wonderful plan God has for their lives. And there, there are women, I'm not sure in the United States people have a concept of that, but there are, there are girls that are born into an area, if, if they are born a girl, their life is, is almost over from that point on. You're absolutely right. And I have sat with so many of them and talked with them. Um, we've sat with mothers in India who have had to give their daughters away because their husband was going to kill them. Um, women who've been beaten because they've given birth to girls. Um, young girls who've been thrown in the trash. Wow. Um, and, and of course, just gender side in general, girls who don't survive because they were girls. Yeah, and I, that, that amazed me that I saw a st statistic that one in four girls in India don't reach puberty. 25% of the females right. that are born because of yeah. things like that. Yeah, and it's, it's a horrendous thing. How do you, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. How do you change that whole uh, 
perception when, it, when you're talking to a girl in India, when she's, she knows from the very beginning she's not valued, she's not as valuable as her brother, how do you change that in her that, that where she really begins to believe that and grab a hold of it? And will it make a difference in her life when she believes it and nobody else does? Yeah, you can't always move toward changing a culture. You really have yeah. to start with changing people one at a time. And you, you can work with a girl for years and years and years and begin to change that. But you also have to work with the families. You have to work with their moms. You have to work with the dads. You have to work with the leaders. Um, one example is a village in Zambia where the leader of that, of that village actually provided the land for the home that we built for girls to go get an education because girls in that area, they have what's called a flag ceremony. And when they reach puberty, when they're of childbearing years, they actually put a flag out over the hut that tells all the men in that area, she's for sale now, oh. she's available. And so instead, we were able to come in and build this home so instead of being sold, they could get an education so that they could help their family in that way instead. And it was the leader of that village who helped provide for that. So that's when culture starts to change. Yeah. You, you think that when you look at Europe, who's a big insurgence of, of uh, refugees and a lot of immigrants coming into Europe, is that, is that being brought in, that same devaluation of women? Or was it? You know, the, yeah, that devaluation of women is, it's, it's just everywhere. It really is. And I've been in other countries where I experienced it personally in a way that as an American, I, I didn't realize was real. You know, when, when I couldn't make an order in a restaurant or when I was treated badly on the street by men. And um, it really opened your eyes, I think, to how strong those attitudes are all over the world. And even here in America, you know, we, we talk about the importance of women being able to be who God wants them to be. But we can't just talk about girl power. You know, that, yeah. that's not enough of an answer. We, we have to be saying the real answer is not strengthen yourself. The real answer is the love of God that's going to change your life. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Project Girl is something that is happening all over the world, right here in the U.S., probably for some of the people who are watching this right now who don't feel like they have the value that they should or the possibilities that they should, that, that God wants to give them. So the big emphasis in, in maybe the Western cultures or maybe even in South America would be more of the human trafficking. Uh, would it be different in, in say, India and in, uh, in the Middle East? The, yeah, the, the unfortunately, human trafficking is a everywhere. huge issue almost everywhere now. Um, but it is definitely uh, a very big problem in Southeast Asia, in, in Europe, um, here in the U.S. And so we're able to help in all those different areas. And I think that's also part of where, if you know Joyce's personal story, because she was sexually abused growing up, and her desire was so strong wow. to be able to help women who've had that kind of trauma in their lives. Mm -hmm. And even though that's very different, but the, it was really born out of her knowing how she was healed and wanting to help other women with that. So, you know, we, we see movies like Taken or, or whatever we, we may be aware of, but we've walked through red light districts and we've seen um, women sitting outside waiting for men to come in and, and their children sleeping underneath the beds uh, in that situation, which just perpetuates that whole cycle of no getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Their passports are taken away from them. They're, they're lied and tricked, lied to and tricked into these situations, or that poverty is just so bad they feel like they have no other choice. Yeah. And <clears throat> anything that we can do to go in there and make a difference, um, we got to be doing it. Yeah, well, give us a picture of, of one girl that you've, that you've seen, what, what the, the love of God began to awaken in her, where she began to realize that she really was of value. You have a personal yeah. story for that? So many. <laughs> um, I was in Israel, and many of the population of Israel are, are Arab people. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity to meet a really lovely woman named Mayada. And she was born a girl in an Arab family and was told from day one that God made a mistake making her. And so because of that, and 
she, she, her life was just shattered. I mean, she felt like she was a mistake, that God hated her, hated her was the word that she used. And so we were able to spend a lot of time with her and learn more about what that was like in her culture. But it, not just that, you have to not blame the culture sometimes. Mm -hmm. it's, sometimes it's a family. Sometimes it's something that is very specific to a person. But you can make a difference and you can change that outlook. So Mayata was able to really eventually dig into what God's word said about who she was and get away from that family and that she was married into an abusive situation as well. And her life just began turning around. And I'll never forget her words because she was just so lovely. And she said, I never felt like I was good enough. I was a mistake. I wasn't pretty enough. I deserve this abuse. Then I realized that if God wanted me to be a man, he could have made me a man. <laughs> And God made me to be this, and I'm beautiful in who I am. So when you see that kind of turnaround, mm -hmm. you, you don't forget that. You know? right. And there's so many women like Mayata that, that I've got to spend time with that right. I, I just love them. And I love what God has done in their lives. And he's just doing it all the time. And you're, you're speaking to people in our audience right now that have been through what Joyce went through. They've been through what yeah. some of the things you're talking about. What, what Absolutely. Can you, what can you say to them? You know, I, I'm one of those why people. I ask God a lot of why mm -hmm. questions. And so being in that situation, I know so many people ask that why question or they blame themselves or they feel like um, God abandoned them in, into that situation. And I, I think it is when you see the progress of other people, when you see the healing that other people have experienced that you start to think, wow, maybe God would do that for me too. And that's what's so encouraging is reading those scriptures that are for them too, knowing that God thinks of them so many times a day that it outnumbers the grains of sand and the stars in the sky, that that's how much he loves them. And those, those little nuggets of truth that as they begin to sink in, and what Joy says is always just telling them, reminding me of that over and over and over and over until it becomes a reality instead of just what somebody else said about me. And um, I, lives change in really big ways that way. It becomes truth in their own life. How can, yeah. people get, how can people get involved? I mean, it's specifically in Project Girl, if they've got a heart for what you're talking about right now. Yeah. Our website is projectgirlgrl.org. And so if you go there, you can learn all about Project Girl and those main initiatives. Like I said, it's sharing Christ through the Word of God, the water initiatives, the anti-human trafficking, the feeding and the education. You can read more about those. You can hear some of those stories, the statistics that are so true. And really realizing the importance of, you know, like for me as a woman, okay, I... I haven't experienced these things firsthand until I went to other countries and experienced it that way. But I have two daughters, and I have the most precious little beautiful granddaughter anywhere on the planet. And so because of those girls, you know, I'm going to fight and I'm going to do anything I can to help women and girls all over the world because it's just a, a passion. So if any one of you out there have that same kind of passion, you can join us and together we'll fight for girls all over the world. Well, keep up the good fight. Tell Joyce, that I know she will keep up that good fight, but, but thank you so much for being with us today. We, we, we've been really blessed by it. Thank you. Thank you. TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Placey to let everyone know that the Bible is still relevant today. Viewpoint is not only available on TV44's powerful broadcast stations and cable systems covering Northwest Ohio, but additionally, anyone can watch programs and exclusive bonus features on YouTube. And we've expanded Viewpoint's reach as you can now listen at work or in your car on the Viewpoint with Bob Lacey podcast. Would you like to help expand our reach? Then sign into YouTube with your account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now could do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places even missionaries can't reach. Help us today reach the world. Share Viewpoint with Bob Lacey today.
This is where, on other programs, you'd be watching a commercial, but not on Viewpoint. If you've never supported TV44 before and enjoy Bob's interviews on Viewpoint, we encourage you to please support us today. Go to WTLW.com and click Donate. Does God allow suffering? Does He cause it for our punishment or to learn some principle we haven't grasped yet? Rebecca McLaughlin is a PhD in pastoral studies from Cambridge University and is the author of this book, Confronting Christianity. I ask her, what is God's role or responsibility with our suffering? Rebecca, there's a question here that I, I think many, many, many people ask when they're challenging Christianity is that, uh, well, there's two questions really. How could a loving God send people to hell? But maybe a greater question than that is, how could a loving God allow so much suffering in the world? Mm. Why, why do people mm -hmm. suffer and why do Christians suffer? If we're, we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, why do, why do we suffer? Mm. Great questions, yeah. We tend to come to the scriptures with this idea that if God loved us, he couldn't intend for us to suffer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I absolutely love the verse, Romans 8, 28, which says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And you think, great, you know, yeah. let's put that on the coffee mug. Everything's going to turn out for good because I, I love Jesus. And ultimately that is true. But if you read on in that verse, it talks about us being conformed to the likeness of Christ as our good. And if we think about the life that Jesus led and the work that he did, it was a life of suffering and it was a life that culminated in his death and resurrection. And I think there, when we have the death and the resurrection, the crucifixion and the, the glorious rising again, we have a little glimpse of, of where we are and ourselves in the Christian story. So Jesus has died in our place. He has taken God's punishment for us. He has defeated death for us. So we do not have to be afraid to die. However, we are absolutely nowhere promised an, an easy life as Christians. In fact, if you look um, through the Bible, you'll find that it is a book written by suffering people for suffering people. Mm -hmm. And pretty much on every page of the scriptures, we see this. I mean, possibly not in the Song of Songs, like that may be the one exception to this rule. Pretty much every book of the Bible is talking to suffering people. And um, a, a question that we need to ask ourselves is what could possibly be worth all of this suffering, whether it's our own or suffering of um, friends or suffering that we see around the world. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' astonishing claim is that he is. He is the one who is worth all this suffering. And um, for me, uh, the most powerful uh, um, chapter in the Bible on this is, is John chapter 11, when we read about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Yeah. And it's not because of the headline news, you know, Jesus raises a man from the dead, which is an important part of the story. It's the conversations that Jesus has with Lazarus's sisters in the run up to that. So if you remember the story, mm -hmm. Mary and Martha are friends with Jesus. Their brother is sick and looks like he's going to die. But great news, they know the healer. So they call Jesus, you know, send a message to him. And they say, you know, Lord, the one you love is, is, is sick, come. And the Bible says to us, because Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he didn't come. Because he loved them, he waited four days and let Lazarus die. And then he came, and even then, he doesn't just come and say, okay, I'm here to, I'm here to raise Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Martha meets him and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will do for you. And Jesus says, yeah, your brother will rise again. And it's like that theological answer, you know, one day everything will be okay. She says, yes, Lord, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But you can almost hear her frustration, like, yeah. what about now, Jesus? What about now? I need, I, I need you to do something now. Don't give me the theological answers. And Jesus looks into this grieving woman's eyes and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord. So Jesus is saying to her, what you most need right now is not me to raise Lazarus from the dead. It is me. I am the resurrection and the life. So he has that conversation with her. And then I love the next step. So he goes, and Mary comes out and says the same question, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And he goes with the sisters to the tomb and he cries with them. He weeps with them. So we are in a relationship with someone who not only um, has the power to heal our suffering, but also has the compassion to weep with us in our suffering. And in both of those pieces, Jesus um, is able to pursue relationship with Mary and Martha. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. We also have the one man who can call a dead man out of his grave. And so the question for us is, is where are we in the story as we're suffering? And the Bible will say to us, if we're, if we're Christians, that 
however much suffering we're enduring now, we're not at the end of the story. That we're in relationship with the one who is meeting us and being intimate with us in this suffering. And actually this may be a way we can experience him that we could not have experienced him without the suffering. But we are also in relationship with the one who can raise the dead and will one day wipe every tear from our eyes. And you look at a, at a book like Job and people say, well, God doesn't cause suffering. He doesn't create cancer. He doesn't give these things. He released Job to, for the enemy to, to, to cause these problems. Or we're, we live in a fallen world. Does God really, does he want us to walk through that mm. suffering? Does he cause any mm. of it? Mm. Yeah, again, I mean, I'd go back to John 11. It's a very interesting moment when Jesus is weeping outside Lazarus's tomb. And the, the people observing say two things. First, they say, oh, look how he loved him. But then others say, hmm, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also stopped Lazarus from dying? And the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, it seems very deliberate that Jesus wanted Lazarus to be dead before he came. He wanted that suffering to happen, both for Lazarus and for his sisters. So I think when we come to the Bible with this idea, we're, we're sort of, trying to get God off the hook mm -hmm. of intending suffering for his people, I think we have a really hard time. And not least because God intended for the person he most loved in all of history, Jesus Christ, he intended for him to suffer and die. I think we have a really hard time kind of getting God off that hook. And I don't think we actually need to. Well, we like to say God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And we think mm -hmm. this is, these are not good things. Is it are, the way we define God's goodness? Yeah, again, I, I think we need to um, have a, a high view of, of God's sovereignty and God's knowledge of what is good for us and what is not. And um, as a parent, I experienced this. I mean, you take your baby to get immunized and you are holding this little little baby while strangers make them hurt mm -hmm. for no reason. I mean, for no immediate reason. They are not sick right now. And a stranger is sticking needles into their body and the baby's crying and looking at you with this like look of absolute, like, how could you do this to me? How are you letting me down like this? You're just making me hurt for no reason. And you as a parent know that it, is, it really is for a reason. Um, but but the, the baby doesn't know that. And I think we need to recognize that we are infants in the hand of God mm -hmm. and that he really does know what's, what's good for us and, and what often feels extremely painful for us is something that he promises he is working for our good. I'm not saying that's easy, but I think it's what the scriptures say. Yeah, it's, it's never easy. Uh, and, and researching this book, and, uh, and all the research you've done as an apologist. Uh, you spent a lot of time in God's Word. Is there anything that you've discovered, anything that you've wrestled over yourself that was tough to get your faith around or tough to get your, your mind around? You said, this, this scripture or this concept, uh, I, I just, God's going to have to reveal something special to me to, to be able to accept this. Mm -mm. I think the, the most challenging chapter for me to write for various reasons was a chapter, I think it's chapter 10, which is, uh, doesn't the Bible condone slavery? Yes. I think this is a particularly important question um, for uh, Americans with the history of, of slavery in this country. And it's something that I hadn't done a lot of research on prior to writing this book. Most of the other chapters were things I'd actually been you know, mulling over and mm -hmm. researching for at least a decade. Yeah. But this was something I was coming to more fresh. And as I dug into the scriptures, um, I, I saw time and again that actually, you know, both in the Old Testament where um, clearly there is a practice of slavery and even, you know, Abraham um, has, uh, you know, ends up sleeping with his, his Hagar. wife, slave girl, Agar. Mm -hmm. and, and you read that and you think, oh my goodness, like the headline news, the, the first person God chose to be the sort of um, the patriarch of his entire people is having sex with a slave like that is that's completely awful but then if you look at that story in context you realize that wasn't what god commanded in fact that was an act of of disbelief it's really on the part of abraham and sarah they weren't trusting god that he could do what he said he was going to do and then if you look at how god interacts with hagar she is the first person in the bible to give god a name um she calls god the god who sees me and God reveals himself to Hagar and makes promises to Hagar that sort of actually parallel his promises to Abraham. Because mm. in, in the, the culture of the day, it would have been completely extraordinary. Like this is, this is a woman and this is a, a slave woman, um, you know, more, moreover. And the God of the universe is initiating a special relationship with her. And then we see um, Joseph going into Egypt and we see the entire um, history of God's people being a history of emancipated slaves. 
So it's not that the Bible is kind of looking at, at slavery um, from the outside. Actually, God's people look at slavery from the inside of the, from the Old Testament, having been slaves themselves. And, and you see um, multiple provisions made for, for slaves in the Old Testament who in um, other cultures would not have had those, those kinds of provisions. And then you see in the New Testament, and I completely love this, um, Paul's letter to Philemon. So again, headline news of Paul, Paul's letter to Philemon is Paul sends a runaway slave back to his master. And you're thinking, okay, there it is. Like the Bible must condone slavery if Paul's sending this runaway slave back. To his but then you read the letter and you find that Paul uses more affectionate terms for Onesimus, the runaway slave, than for any other individual he writes about. As I mentioned, I mentioned before, he calls Onesimus his very heart and he says he is like a father to him. And he, he tells Philemon to receive Onesimus as Philemon would receive Paul himself. So he's saying, like in a culture where a runaway slave going back to their master could expect to be beaten and you know massively ill-treated, he's saying, treat this man like a brother and in fact, like an apostle, like the person you most respect. That's how I want you to treat this man. So the idea that that is um, condoning a practice of slavery of like dehumanizing and owning another person is, is actually, she completely subverted in, in Paul's letter to Philemon. And I think we see that recurrently as the Bible talks about slavery. So I think it's it's one of those questions where you have to you have to dig deep and look hard. But actually I think we, we end up with a pretty um, a pretty beautiful vision from the scriptures. Well, there, if, as you go through this book, there, you, you've touched on a lot of it and you haven't uh, sugarcoated any of it. I really appreciate the book. Uh, again, it's C Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. And Rebecca, thank you so much for being with us. You have been a blessing. Thanks so much, Bob. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Remember, Viewpoint is made possible entirely by the financial support of viewers just like you. Also remember, you can catch Viewpoint interviews on YouTube and on iTunes and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.